Welcome back to the Heart and Soul podcast. I'm your host, Imam Yasser, where we talk about Islamic spirituality. Let's begin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyi ladhi istafa. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man ihtada bi huda amma ba'd. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim. In our last episode, we talked about spirituality. We talked about death and how the soul journeys through the other realm. We discussed the story of a Sahabi who passed away, and then he came back and conveyed some messages from the other realm. The story of Thabit bin Qais radiallahu anhu is a famous story in this regard. Thabit bin Qais radiallahu anhu, he was a Khazraji, meaning he belonged to the Khazraj tribe. He passed away in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. What was his story? What was something that was so unique that was in Islamic history that was recorded by our scholars? Sabit bin Qais radiallahu anhu took part in a battle and he was wearing body armor that was very expensive. And at that time in the medieval days, people used to invest in their own body armor and there was no government support for anybody preparing for battle. And that is why in our tradition, the Prophet ﷺ instituted reward for the people who invested in defending the country from their own pocket. After the battle was won, he would give them their rewards, which is called ghanima. Thabit bin Qais who wore a very expensive body armor, when he died in the battle, fighting and defending, of course, the Muslims, one of the Muslims who was passing by, he saw him laying down after he passed away. So he thought that I can take his body armor and use it for myself without letting anybody know. So he took the body armor from Thabit bin Qais radiallahu anhu's dead body and he took it for him own for his own use and did not tell anybody at that night after of course the battle subsided one of the muslims in the army saw thabit bin qais radiyallahu anhu in his dream and thabit radiyallahu anhu told him that i am warning you this is not a dream i am talking to you and i'm going to give you some instructions and I want you to convey my instructions and my will to the general who is leading the army, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, the companion, and then ask him to convey this to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu in Medina. Thabit bin Qais radiallahu anhu said that my body armor was taken by a fellow Muslim and my body armor is now hidden on the back of his horse and that person is at the very end of the encampment. So please go tell Khalid radiallahu anhu to retrieve my body armor from that Muslim that I'm telling you about. And then once you have that body armor, take it to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and tell him to sell it and then free a slave that I have and also divide the money that is left over into the people from my family who are the due inheritors. That man woke up from his dream and he went to the general, Khalid bin Walid, and he told him the dream. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu realized that this is a message from the other world, a message from the spirit of Thabit bin Qais. So he sent a soldier to the exact spot where Thabit bin Qais told him that his body armor was hidden and surely enough they found the body armor on the back of the horse exactly like he described with one Muslim soldier. They retrieved the body armor and then Khalid radiallahu anhu went to Abu Bakr Siddiq who at that time was the leader of the Muslims and he told him the whole story that Thabit bin Qais was martyred in the battle he came in a dream and this, these were the instructions that he provided. Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu did not hesitate at all. And he took the body armor 
and did with it exactly like how Thabit bin Qais instructed him. And the people who recorded this historical incidents, they say that Thabit bin Qais عنه, was one of the Muslims whose will came to pass after his death. Generally, it is the Sunnah that the person writes his will before he dies. But in this case, a person who passed away and then from the spirit world came back and then gave instructions. And Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu accepted those instructions and pretty much executed them however he instructed. So this is the story. This is one of the stories of many stories from the Sahaba where there are spiritual experiences amongst the Sahaba and people who were the students of the Sahaba, the Salaf al-Salihin or the Tabi'in. Now this brings us to another question. The question is that we live in a world and this universe, it has, like we said before, aspects that are tangible and aspects that are beyond tangible. Aspects that we cannot see with our eyes, but we can feel them and we can sense them. And if a person does not careful and he does not read and follow the scientific literature, he will realize, uh, I mean, he will not realize that these things are actual reality. All of our body has a natural frequency. Yes, the whole human body has a natural frequency. They did a study and they did a study on what is the measurable amount of the human body's frequency. They found in a sample of 36 adults from random walks of life that the body emits frequency between 9 kilohertz to 12. So 9 to 12 is the range, right? Now the earth also has a frequency, and that is 7, right? Let's talk about the human being's organs, do they emit frequencies? Yes, they do. So the human body has a frequency, the organs within the human body have frequency, and every living thing and everything in this world has a frequency. Some people might say, well, this is sort of quackery, it's not really real. Well, let me draw your attention to one thing. If you go to the Canadian Center of Occupational Health and Safety, they actually list what they call vibration exposure. Like if you're working in an industry, like you are a truck driver, or you're a person who works in construction, or a person who works in, let's say, making steel, your body can actually get exposed to vibration. And they actually list. They call it segmental vibration exposure, or they call it whole body vibration exposure. Let's see what they did, what they say. They say, for segmental vibration exposure, it affects the organs, part of the segment of the body, the most widely studied and most common type of segmental vibration exposure is hand-arm vibration exposure, with, which affects the hands and the arms. And they give examples, like the industry is agriculture, right? or boiler making, it's a hand or arm, pneumatic tools, like tools that have pressure and those pressure guns. What about diamond cutting? The person who cuts a diamond, they say he has vibration exposure for the hand and the arm. Similarly, people who work in the iron and steel industry or lumber, they also have hand and arm exposure because they're using chainsaws or many other tools. So this is actually an occupational hazard. I mean, the Canadian uh, agency, which is the Canadian Center of Occupational Health and Safety, which is equal to OSHA in the United States, right, is saying that there is something called vibration exposure to the human body that for people who work in different industries. So this brings us into another realm of understanding. Everything and anything in this world and universe has a vibration. So what if our vibration is off? Let's see. In 1952, a physicist named Winfried Otto Schumann 
proposed the existence of natural electromagnetic waves surrounding the planet. Eight years later, the biologist Rutger Weaver conducted experiments to show that these waves could positively influence the health and the well-being of human beings. Finally, in the late 70s, these waves, known as the Schumann resonance waves, were detected from a balloon by our research team in Japan. Here is a device. This is called a sleep bracelet. And it is by Philip Stein. And Philip Stein is a company that makes sleep bracelets that actually adjust your body frequency that has changed because of stress or anxiety or many other uh, things in life to what they call the natural frequency of Earth. They did a clinical study. And they found that in that clinical study, the people who wore the bracelet and the people who did not wear a bracelet or a placebo, meaning a fake bracelet that does not have that device, that does not emit that natural frequency, right? The people who wore the Philip Stein bracelet, their stress level decreased, their sleep quality improved, their mood and anxiety dissipated, and it was actually statistically significant, meaning that that device made an impact. You can research anything you want. You can make any medicine you want, but if it does not provide statistical data that is impactful, the FDA will not clear it, or other health agencies in the world are not going to approve it. But that device by Philip Stein, and by the way, I actually use it as well. I wear it half an hour before I go to sleep, and I have significantly seen uh, improvement in the quality of sleep that I have experienced personally. I'm not going to promote this. I'm not their ambassador, but I'm just letting you know that these types of things do exist where now we have technology that affects the body's natural frequency and helps us deal with stress, anxiety, and other things that we're dealing with. We are surrounded by mobile devices, gadgets, cars, noises, and all of those things combined have an impact. Another article that we would like to discuss today is an article that was written in the ma magazine, which is very prestigious, called Nature, volume 436, July 7th, 2005. It was written by a very, very highly regarded scientist, Rich Richard Kahn Henry. He's a professor uh, of physics and astronomy in John Hopkins. John Hopkins is a very reputable institution in the world. The article is The Mental Universe. That's the title of the article. Look what he says. He wrote the article. The title was The Mental Universe. He says the only reality, the only reality is mind and observations. But observations are not things. To see the universe as it really is, we must abandon our tendency to conceptualize observations as things. He talks about the spiritual nature or the mental nature of the universe. And he talks about how Galileo was a person back in history who changed the perception of everybody in the world by proving that the earth goes around the sun. And he said that was an example of physics outreach. Like physics at that time was able, Galileo was able to convince the world that what he thought is the truth. It's not the sun that goes around the earth, but the earth goes around the sun. He says this was a stunning accomplishment in physics outreach. Right? With the subsequent work of Isaac Newton, physics joined religion in seeking to explain our place in the universe. He says the more recent physics revolution of the past 80 years has yet to transform the general public understanding in a similar way. He actually is complaining 
that the current physicists are not doing a good enough job in convincing the world that the universe is more spiritual than rather material. And then look what he says. He says, As noted by Newton's biographer, Richard Westfall, the ultimate cause of atheism, Newton asserted, is this notion of bodies having, as it were, a complete, absolute, and independent reality in themselves. Subhanallah. We have heard many stories where Muslims who have now abandoned their religion and have now become atheists. And what does Newton say? Newton says that the reason for atheism and not believing in deism, which is, of course, the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that these people believe that the bodies, right, have an independent reality in themselves. I've never heard a definition of atheism or why a person is led to atheism more impactful more beautiful than what Newton actually said. He says then, Richard Con Henry in his article, the 1925 discovery of quantum mechanics solved the problem of the universe's nature. Right? Bright physicists were again led to believe the unbelievable, this time that the universe is mental. So the word he uses here, mental, he says in the end of the article, is spiritual. So for him, he's using the word mental. For us, as in Islam, is spiritual. Like they say in Arabic, ruhani, meaning it is based off the spirit. He says, Sir James Jeans says, he quotes him, the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality. The stream of knowledge of physics is heading towards a non-mechanical reality, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. Subhanallah. And that's why we say in Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, which is azali, which is qadim, which is a historical old ancient knowledge, is the one that brought this universe into being. And then he discusses how the physicists should do a better job of conveying this to the normal population that look, our, our universe is actually spiritual. It is not material, right? So the basis is spiritual and then material exists after spirituality. He continues and he says, in the place of underlying stuff, there have been serious attempts to preserve a material world, but they only, but they produce no new physics and serve only to preserve an illusion. Scientists have sadly left it to the non-physicist brain to note the emperor's lack of clothes. It seems to me that the view, right, which gel man favors and which involves what he calls alternative histories or narratives is precisely an anthropocentric as bores since histories and narratives are not freestanding elements of the universe. He criticizes the people who are not doing a good enough job of convey, conveying to the general public that we live in a spiritual universe. He says one benefit of switching humanity to the correct perception of the world is the resulting joy of discovering the mental nature of the universe, meaning the spiritual nature. And then he finishes, he finishes his article. He says, the universe is immaterial, meaning it's spiritual. And then he says, mental and spiritual live and enjoy. Meaning that once you realize that the material nature of the universe is secondary to the spiritual, then you are set free and then you enjoy and live your life peacefully. 
the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed meanings that are of the same type and even more superior in his dua. In the in Sahih Tirmidhi, the book and collection of hadith called Tirmidhi, Imam Tirmidhi's book, hadith number 3422 talks about when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wake up in the night and he used to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and during in this long supplication he would say a very key phrase he says labbayka wa sa'dayk wal khayru kulluhu fi yadayk that i come to you labbayk wa sa'dayk i am present in front of you O my lord at your calling wal khayru kulluhu fi yadayk and all goodness belongs in your blessed hands wa sharru laysa ilayk and there is no evil that can be attributed to you, O Allah, as the source. وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ And you are not the source of evil in this world. It cannot be attributed to you. And then he says, أَنَا بِكَ وَإِلَيْكَ I am because of you. My existence is because of you. وإليك, and I belong and I am living and I will return to you. Ana bika wa ilayk. I am because of you and I am for you as far as my life. When it finishes, I will return to you. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ exactly negates the exact cause of atheism that Newton stressed. He said that atheism was because the notion bodies having, as it were, a complete, absolute, and independent reality, not a dependent reality. The Rasul is saying in his dua, Ana bika, that my, re- my existence is dependent on you, O Allah. While the atheists think what? That their existence is independent an absolute a reality in themselves. And the Prophet totally negated that with his beautiful dua. So what does this teach us? It teaches us the concept of Islamic spirituality in which in spirituality we are taught what they call al-fana fillah. What is fana fillah? Fana basically means that you do not ascribe an independent existence to yourself and you realize that your existence, even if it seems independent to you, is because Allah has made you exist every second. And that's why in the Aqeedah al tahawiyyah which is the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, in the very end of the Aqeedah, right, he says a beautiful statement. مَنْ يَظُنُّ أَنَّهُ يَسْتَغْنِي عَنِ اللَّهِ طَرْفَةَ عين. Whoever believes that he is independent from Allah, supporting his existence, even for an eye blink or a nanosecond, that he is doomed and he will be from the people who will be devastated on the Day of Judgment. Because he realizes that Allah is the Qayyum, He makes everything exist and continue the continuity of myself and my existence, the continuity of this universe is because Allah is the source of that continuity. It is not because I'm an autopilot and Allah created me and disassociated with me, right? From his, what they call, force or continuity to exist. So that's the meaning of the hadith. That is exactly what Newton was saying. So imagine that Newton actually was stressing the same point and our Prophet ﷺ not only showed that at the beginning but something very superior that I exist, O Allah, because of you I continue to exist because of you and I will return to you as well because I have no independent existence I have a dependent existence on your ability to continue supporting my existence, O Allah because of your immense majesty and power 
and grace and beauty and your wisdom that is beyond the understanding of humanity. So this brings us to the end of this episode that we've learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who sustains the continuity of existence. And even Newton sort of echoed those sentiments, you know, in our scientific tradition for humans. And we learned about Thabit bin Qais radiallahu anhu and his spirituality. We learned about the natural frequencies of the bodies and the organs and how we can be affected by vibrations. In our next episode, we will talk about how an individual is affected by these vibrations and how they impact a person's behavior and his moral life. وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيْدْنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ جُمَعِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَةٌ